Okay, now let's catch up uh, just in case we don't remember last Sunday. Who remembers what, what Jesus did last Sunday? Who remember? We, we celebrated Jesus feeding the 5,000 men plus women and children. And we talked about the fact that leading up to this, Jesus has just found out some very sad news. Do you remember what that was? John the Baptist has been beheaded by Herod. And, um, and so Jesus, at the beginning of the day that he fed 5,000, was really feeling the need to just pull away and have some quiet time with God. And, and yet his popularity had grown because um, people had heard of the great things that he was doing, of the miracles, of the teaching about God's love and God's kingdom. And they just said, I want some of that. I want to be near Jesus. I want to know what he's got. I want to be touched by the life and the ministry of Jesus. And so when they saw Jesus head out um, to, on the boat to kind of get away from the crowds, they all said, if we run quickly, we can beat Jesus to the other side of the lake. And so they all ran, and as they ran around the towns and villages around the lake, they must have told more people because by the time Jesus got to the other side, the crowd was huge. And most of us, if we were in that frame of mind of needing to pull away of needing to have some quiet time, of needing to think about ourselves for a moment, most of us would have said, oh, why can't they just leave me alone? But not Jesus. Scripture tells us that Jesus looked upon that crowd and the only emotion that he had was compassion. Compassion for their brokenness, compassion for their illness, compassion for their need to know. And so Jesus spent the day with them. Now, so we pick up the scripture at the end of that day, after Jesus has fed the 5,000, um, walked a miracle there, and um, Jesus is still in need of that solitude time. And so this is where we pick up chapter 14 of Matthew's Gospel, reading verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of them to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come on, come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Let us pray. Holy and awesome are you, Almighty God. In your witness and in your faithfulness toward us, we have gained faith. We have gained salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ, and we love you. And we have so much to give you thanks for, but sometimes we just don't know how to live. We don't know how to, to, to go through life faithfully. We don't know how to take the risks that are sometimes necessary to serve you. So touch us this day, God. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts and our minds to all that is you, that we may know you, that we may see you, that we may live for you. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, most of you know about uh, the story about the three preachers that went fishing, probably. They went fishing out on the lake, and, um, and uh, they could tell stories on each other, but they figured if all three of them were there from different denominations, there was a Baptist, a Catholic, and a Methodist, and if they were all there, they could tell the stories the way that they heard them instead of hearing them through the grapevine. And so it was good accountability for three, these three guys. And, and while they were out fishing, one of the um, ministers, the, the Catholic minister, um, ran out of bait. And um, so he stepped up and stepped onto the water and walked over to shore and got his bait out of the vehicle and walked back across the water, got back in the boat, continued to fish. 
Well, after a little while, the Baptist minister ran out of bait too. So he stood up, stepped out of the boat, walked on the water over to the shore, got to the vehicle, got his bait, walked back across the water, stepped back into the boat. Well, the Methodist minister was amazed. How did they do that? But if the Catholics and even the Baptists can do this, I can do it too. After all, I'm out of bait too. So the Methodist stepped out of the water and bloop, down he went, down into the water. At which time the Catholic priest leaned over to the Baptist minister and said, Think we ought to tell them where the rocks are? <laughs> we all want to do miracles. We all want to do something great. We all want to have the guts to step out in faith, don't we? And I truly do, um, as I said earlier, I truly do love Peter. I love his nature. I love his character. And of all the disciples, and maybe it's just because I am who I am and I'm the goofy woman that you have come to love and know as your pastor, and accept anyway, um, I think. Um, <laughs> because I am the goofy person that I am, maybe that's why I identify so much with Peter. But I think of all the disciples and all the things that they did, out of all of them, I think I learned the most from Peter. Because Peter was willing to stick out his neck, even though it might get chopped off at any minute. Peter was willing to step out to Jesus and say, Jesus, you don't really want to do that. To which Jesus would turn to Peter and say, the harshest of things that anyone could say to a disciple, I would think. Get behind me, Satan. You want the things of this world. I am living and teaching about the things that are beyond this world. And so of all the disciples, of all the things that Peter does, of all the ways that he pushes the buttons, of all the ways that he tests the limits, Jesus teaches some great lessons through Peter. So it's no surprise to me in this story that Peter is the one. Now just think of the frame of mind of the disciples in the boat out on the water. They, too, would have had an admiration and a love and a respect for John the Baptist. Even though they weren't connected to John the way that Jesus was, they had come to know that John was a great man of God's faithfulness and that John had truly paved the way for the Messiah to come. And so the, the death of, John's, um, of, of John the Baptist certainly would have affected the disciples. Not maybe as much as Jesus and some other people, but certainly they would have been affected by that. And they too, probably when Jesus said, let's just pull away today. Just, let's just take some time for us. I don't know about you, but when somebody says to me, let's just take some time for us, or take some time for yourself. Yesterday we woke up and Maurice said, well, we can mow. I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, well, we can just relax a little today. He had worked until 2.30 in the morning, and so I was like, let's relax. And, and he gave me permission to take all those things that I had on my list, the things that I thought I had to get accomplished, and set them aside and say, it's okay to rest every now and then. It's okay to stop. And so the disciples must have been in that mode of, oh, thank goodness, a day without crowds pressing in, asking us things, a day of of being able to just be with Jesus all by ourselves. What a great day this is going to be. And then for them to have the great crowds. And then to start worrying while Jesus was still teaching, hearing people's stomachs start growling because it was mealtime, wondering what in the world are we going to do because there's not enough bread in any village surrounding us to feed all of these people. Jesus, send them away. And then Jesus turned to the disciples and said, No, you feed them. Jesus, please send them away. We, we don't have anything but these five little loaves and these two little fishes. Jesus, send them away. And Jesus does another miracle. And the crowds, remember, remember we talked about last week, the crowds were satisfied. It wasn't just the, ah, oh, I've eaten well. It was the, remember what I said last week, push back from the table, unbutton your pants because you're so full, you can't hardly remove that kind of fulfillment. Jesus had fed their spirits. Jesus had fed their bodies. And, ah, they were satisfied. 
Now, with all of those things in mind, by the end of the day, I would have been tired. I would think the disciples were really ready for some time away. And so when Jesus says, go ahead, go ahead and I'll meet you later, I'm sure Peter, I don't know what the other disciples, they were probably way more practical, they were thinking about the boat, Peter was probably thinking, how are you going to get there, Jesus? If we're leaving you behind, how are you going to get there? But, you know, too many times Jesus had done these things, and too many times Jesus had told them to do something, and they did it. And they were followed after Jesus, and they were faithful to him. And so they got in the boat, and they headed out. And expecting to have a night of rest, a storm kicked up. Have you ever been on a boat when a storm kicked up? Ugh, especially after you ate a big meal. <laughs> Not fun. Not fun. And the disciples, can you imagine this little boat crossing <coughs> to and fro with 12 disciples on it? Nobody really knowing what to do or how to handle because as soon as you get in a situation like that, you just forget everything that you ever learned. I remember one time I was with the youth group down at the beach and, and um, I decided to swim out to see how far the sandbar was. The kids wanted to go out to the sandbar. So I started swimming out and it wasn't too far and so I started swimming back in to tell them that they could go and I got caught in a riptide. And um, suddenly all the things I was taught about a riptide just went out of my head. I didn't even know that I was in a riptide, but I knew that I was swimming and I was swimming and I was swimming and I was getting tired and I wasn't getting any closer to the shore. And I went, oh, this must be a riptide. What do you do? All of a sudden, I was like, okay, I've always been told what to do when I was in a riptide. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And finally, after swimming and swimming and swimming, finally I went, swim with the shore. And as soon as I turned and started swimming parallel to the shore, it kicked me right out and I swam off. And, and so the disciples out in the boat being tossed to and fro, I'm sure they were fishermen. They've been in storms before. But when you get in that situation and you get afraid and you're working hard and you're wondering what you're supposed to do, all of a sudden all the logic goes right out of your brain. About that time, it is now the fourth watch of the night which according to our time clocks would be somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. About that time, across the lake, they could see the shadow of a figure. Um, the fourth watch of the night is always the darkest watch. So not only were they being tossed to and fro, not only was it dark and they couldn't even tell which way they were going, but then they see the shadow coming across the lake. <coughs> and they think it's a ghost. It's a ghost! Already, the fear and doubt that they were experiencing as they're tossed to and fro by the waves of the storm, and now an apparition coming across the lake to them. And it's Peter that squishes up his little face and goes, Hey, I think that's Jesus. Jesus? Is that you? And Jesus answers in a very profound way. He just says, It is I. He doesn't say, yeah, it's me, Jesus, Peter, stay in the boat, I'll be right there, the storm's going to be okay, y'all just pull it together, I'm on my way. Jesus just says, it is I. Now remember, think back to the story of Moses and the burning bush. And remember when Moses is standing there and he's getting his instructions from God, and he says, God, he's, he's used up his whole list of, of excuses for not doing what God wants him to do. And finally he says, God, who shall I say is sending me? And God says, I am. And you think, what a silly answer. But what a profound answer. Because in saying, I am, in that moment, God says to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I'm going to be. I cannot be labeled. I will not be put in a box so that you can figure out what I'm going to do. I'm going to be who I'm going to be, what I'm going to be. And so when Jesus says, it is I, in the language of, of the Greeks, the, the language was the same as I am. And at that moment, the I am was walking on the water. The great I am, who sometimes is the calming spirit of one just saying, here's how it is in the kingdom of God. And sometimes is the one who's saying, get behind me, Satan. The one who's walking on the water just says, I am. I am what you will need in the midst of the storm. I am what you will need when you are filled with fear 
and doubt about the thing that you're stuck in. I am. I am. Back to Peter. Well, Jesus, if that's really you, testing the limits again, pushing the buttons, if that's really you, call me to come out. And Jesus simply says, come. Now, Peter, in what most of us would consider as a goofy, goofy thing to do, takes a great leap of faith when believing that he has seen Jesus Christ steps out of the boat. Well, the boat was a doubtful and a scary and a rocky place to be, but at least it was, you know, a boat on the water. It was the safest place that he had at the moment. But he had the nerve to step out of the boat. And I can envision Peter cinching up his robe a little bit and walking on the water, looking at Jesus. Walking on water! Jesus! Is that, is that really you, Jesus? I'm walking on the water to you. And all of a sudden, the wind blows and some of the waves splash up against his leg. And Peter goes, oh no, I'm walking on water. I'm walking on water. I can't walk on water. And guess what happened? He began to sink. Think about the moment that Peter began to sink. Think about the moments when you have begun to sink. Amen. I bet if you think back, it's the time when you lost your focus on Jesus Christ. Because as long as, Je as, as Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on water, he was going to him, he was doing the impossible but when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. Oh, little faith. That was Peter's nickname, I think. Mine too. Oh, little faith. Why did you doubt? And Jesus reaches out and pulls him back in the boat. And then the storm, the storm stops. But for all the goofy things that Peter does, for all the ways that he tests the limits, I admire him because he was the one who had the nerve to step out toward Jesus. You know, you and I as a church, you and I as individuals, you and I, we call ourselves people of faith, but sometimes we're not very faithful because we'd rather stay where it's safe. Even if the boat gets rocky, I know what I have right here. Why do I want to step out? But Jesus is the God, the great I Am, who says to us, come. Step out of your comfortable places where you think it's safe. Step out and have faith in me. This is the same Jesus who said, if you have the faith the size of a teeny tiny, I don't know where they are now, a teeny tiny mustard seed, if you have just that little bit of faith, you can do great things. How courageous to be able to step out for Jesus. How courageous to do some things really great and some things just ordinary. Brothers and sisters, as a church, I pray that we will have the faith, that we will have the nerve to step out when Jesus says, come. And to keep our eyes focused on him. Let us pray. God, we love you and we praise you. And Oh, there's so many times that we fall down. There's so many times that we find ourselves sinking because we don't know where the steps are and because we don't have enough faith to keep our eyes on you. Instead, we become overwhelmed by the things that are right around us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us when we fail to cling to you and to your truth and to your justice and to your mercy. Let us be more faithful as men and women and young people of faith that we might know that you are our God, and when we ask who you are and you say, I am, that we will know that you have promised to be the God that we will need. In any situation, to be the one who is very present and very real, the one who calls us to keep our eyes on you. Thank you, God. Thank you for loving us that way. Teach us to have great faith that we might move mountains all for the sake of your kingdom. Amen.